Okay, guys, we are learning about some types in Python. I think um, this is going to be kind of like data types. I, I, I'm presuming, I just kind of asserting that, but let's let's see if that, that assertion is correct or not. So some types. Remember when I said pure functions are my favorite part of functional programming? Well, some types are a close second. Wonderful. First, what is it not a some type? Product types are the opposite of some types. Product type is made up of multiple instances of other types. For example, tuples, dictionaries, and classes are product types because they are all collections of other types of data. So take a look at this dictionary shape that represents a person. So um, is fat true? Is tall false? Okay, so the total number of combinations a person can have is four, the product of two times two. Oh, I see, because we have two attributes and we have two possible answers. I just held up three, but <laughs> we have two possible answers. <laughs> So fat and tall, fat, not tall, not fat and tall, not fat, not tall. Beautiful. So with a dictionary of three booleans, the total number of possible values would be eight. The product of two times two times two would be eight. So if we had another one is rich. Okay, so a key idea in functional programming is that product types are bug prone because your code has to handle every possible combination of values for certain types. That can be a lot of combinations. Let's see. So define size of seed. We got person's fat, tall, person fat, tall, person not fat, not tall, person not tall, and is fat. else returns small if they're not tall, not fat. Okay, so integer strings floats, boom. While on their own, integer strings and floats are not product types. They do have the same problem when it comes to writing clean code. There are infinite numbers of possible values. In functional programming, we are consistently looking for ways to limit the number of possible values a variable can have. The fewer possible values a variable can have, the easier it is to reason about debug and test. That's wonderful. That's just less stuff to deal with. Just less things. Less is more, right? I like to think of my life that way as well. I'm trying to prune my life, constantly prune my software. Just less is more. Less is more. More minimalism. It, it's like even my workspace, I try to keep very minimal or at least relatively minimal. It allows room to think. You know, I don't, I don't feel cluttered. I could just focus on the thing I'm focusing on. I would say that my desktop is very clean and, and relatively clean. This one's not. I've got another computer that's not clean at all on the desktop, but it's an older one. It's just kind of my, my computer I use for data scraping and, and furtive activities, one might say. Okay, so so a subtype is that, well, let's, let's just kind of screech on forward. I think, I think we've, we've got a good understanding of what subtypes are. So let's say the assignment. Complete the conversion type function. The valid inputs are, are the five doc type variables defined in the editor. Each variable contains a string representing a valid doc type. So here's our five types. Each input has a corresponding type as well below. So something like this. Interesting. So however, since Python doesn't have some types, we do need to handle the cases when the caller passes invalid doc type and raise an exception. Wonderful. Okay, let's see what we got. Let's print the doc type. And it should pop out a few. So we have HTML here, or at least for one of our test cases. Boom. So we have doc, MD for this one, expecting PD. Okay, so we need to roughly follow this type right here. So if doc type is, let's see. So if doc type, we're going to do a whole bunch of if else sta statements. Let's say if doc type equals PDF, we want to change, I, I suppose, doc type to HTML. Is that, is that what I'm saying? Doc type equals doc type, something like that. L if, yeah, let's, let's copy this, this all down, I suppose. And we'll copy that a few times or just punch in what we need to. So if doc type equals this, then our doc type is that, I think, right? If doc type is this, then our doc type is this. If our doc type is MD, then our doc type is, oh, wait, did I just change that? No. Oh, oh, you know what? I don't know if I'm doing this correct might be yeah i might have i might have messed that up okay so let's see so elif 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 i think that's and then worst comes to worst we raise the exception um uh, unknown document type so that's kind of our our default case if we can't define it here but i think i think what we do is we say pdf goes to html right txt goes to this one md or docx goes to md excuse me md goes to pdf and finally, and not least, txt goes to this. Okay, I thought that would work. Huh, 
because we have doc type here, right? I really thought that would work. I really did. So if doc type, let's print the doc type one more time, say doc and pop it here. And let's uh, copy this down. I'll say doc to exclamation. And it should pop out because it, it's it's just these right here, right? So doc type PDF would just be PDF. So I would I would expect this to work at least at least to the to the way my my brain is working, I suppose. Um, I'll find local variable doc. So we can't import that even though it's a non-local variable. Do we have to say non-local? Is that is that what we need to do? I thought that was only for closures, right? So I figured I figured that would just kind of be right there. Let's try this. See if we can make it work, right? A little bit of rigging never killed nobody, right? Yeah, I still I still am not seeing it work the way I'm anticipating it in my brain. Well, let's let's take a peek see at the solution and move forward. I don't want to spend too much time. I really want to get to GoLang. I'm very 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 excited to continue my my learning in that. So let's let's see. So conversion type, boom, doc type. I thought that's yeah, that's roughly what we're doing. I see. Return return it. Okay. There we go. That's what it is. We were super close. So we can, I can't multi-select. Nope, that won't work. That is quite unfortunate. Nope, won't let me multi-select. That's okay. We'll just blast through this real quick. And boom, and boom, and boom. Okay, cool. On to the next bit. I think we only have a few, few things here. So which language does not support proper subtypes? Interesting. I'm not sure. I would imagine TypeScript does. I would imagine Rust does, but but maybe it's both. For example, TypeScript, we could do this where we could define the type of color. It can only be one of these. I use this all the time. It's an like enum type. Okay, so I'm not sure. So is type, can we not define a sum type then? I think, I think it's Python. Yeah, that doesn't support proper sum types. Okay, cool. So why are sum types useful? You have to run your code to see if you've handled all the possible cases. You could know beforehand to know if your sum types are correct or if your code is correct. Okay, so boom. Import enum. Now we're looking at a little TypeScript. This is up my alley, right? So enums are a way to represent a fixed set of values. Enum is a kind of subtype. So in TypeScript, right, if we're def defining a variable, I'll say like my name equals Ryan, right? So the type of this, I'd say type, maybe we'd have a type for name, and I would say my name has to be a string, right? So that's that's more of a uh, more of a some type approach, but the enum approach, you could actually specify and say, let's say if it's like my name associated to employees or something like within our company, we only have, you know, four, maybe like co-founders, right? So, so then, then the name has to match one of these, right? So if, if I assumed uh, my name like this, right? And there's a few ways to declare it. You can do, do it on the other side as as like this, or you could also declare it on this side. But if I had done something, my name is Bill, it would throw an error because it's not one of the types here that's defined. However, it's a string still. So if I did string, that would work. Or I could do this and string, but that kind of defeats the purpose of it. Uh, you could do it any type as well. You could also do maybe a number, right? So your name could be one of these things. Maybe it's a, I don't know, your name's a binary or something. But yeah, that's just a little bit about proper typing in TypeScript. I am not sure what it would look in Python. So let's learn. So enums are a way to represent a fixed set of values as kind of defined there. As mentioned, this is kind of the enum, right? Where it has to be one of those defined values. Okay, so wait, didn't you say that Python doesn't support subtypes? Well, it has enums, which are a kind of subtype, but because Python is dynamically typed, it still doesn't enforce it before runtime in any meaningful way. Interesting. So if we do color, it has to be this. What's the point? While we still have to do the pesky on exception, raise exception of unknown color, there's a few advantages to Python's enums. At least now we have a consistent syntax for defining use of some types in Python. So that's huge. That's powerful to do because we could just consistently do this instead of defining you know, a ridiculous amount of variables. Rather than storing an entire string in memory, we could just store an integer. Red is represented by one under the hood. This is a small performance improvement, but it's still a improvement for performance. If you're really talking about performance improvements though, I think Python's up there on the server side languages, but it's not close to one or two. You know, it's not gonna be a top top dog. If if you're worried about performance, I think Python's a wholesome it's a good language, it's got a good interpreter, it's got a good compilation process, but I wouldn't say it's the primo. If you're worried about performance, use Rust, use Golang, use, I think TypeScript's even faster, but JavaScript is not. 
Yeah, I I wouldn't I wouldn't no Python might be faster. I'm not sure, but but there's a lot of other languages. C plus plus. I think C sharp's faster than Python. If you're worried about performance on the back end, use GoLang, use Rust, use C plus plus, use back end focus. Python's the good rounder. It's the it's the Toyota Camry of Python of language. It's really good at everything. It's solid at everything, but it's not exceptionally phenomenal at one specific thing. Maybe machine learning. I think it's really readable and, and useful for that. I don't know enough about it, but but I don't I don't think again performance. If you're worried about that, you, you're gonna have to use a static language. There's there's no competition with dynamic languages versus static languages. Okay, so even though we store it as an integer, we can still ref refer to it as a as a name as human readable language, not machine readable language. We can access the human readable code. So kind of three and four are the same points. Okay, so complete the doc format to convert enum and convert format function. The doc format enum should have the following values. Excuse me. So we are just gonna steal as all good software engineers do. If you don't steal, you are not a real software engineer. So there's that. There's no more arguing. There's no more. <laughs> what's, the, what's the old saying? Good artists create, great artists steal. There you go. There you go. Okay, so underlying, boom. Order and underlying integer values don't matter as long as you are consistent. The convert format function should support three types of conversions. So we don't need to do HTML because if it's HTML, we'll just leave it HTML, right? Let's see. So this is a heading and it gets wrapped in an H1 if it goes to HTML. And from HTML, it needs to go to this MD format. PDF needs to be wrapped with brackets. Okay, so let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. So we want we want to see the format that it is. Let's let's kind of ideate this out loud. So the content isn't as important. All we're going to do is just just like slice and and add things depending on the content. But basically, we want to see the format, and then we want to make some rules to go to the format that we want. So if if the format is let's see if the format is pdf and, and i might not write the code for all this because again maybe i'm not the most apt but if the format is pdf to html we basically need to convert this to h1 and let me see if i can copy this boom there it is and h1 like this so that's going to be our pdf to format so we basically need to slice and dice and remove these pdf things and put on the h1 closing tags and opening tags. Um, if we want to go from TXT to, let's see, it's like we don't have a TXT one. I think this is just TXT, right? So maybe TXT to PDF is one of the examples. We would just do this to this with PDF around it. Uh-huh. Just like that. That's correct. So we really just need to basically do this and then same thing with MD. So I think I think the way to do it, because all of them have some heading is, is well, there's a few ways to do it, but I think one of the ways to do it is we could just slice the first thing off. So it looks like we can look for the PDF character. If it's a TXT, we can we can figure out what to do from that point. But but I think the first thing we're gonna look for is is what format it is. So then we know what we're working with. And then when we know what format it is, we then can um, programmatically do something, right? And that's that's the name of the game, right? So let's see, doc format. We'll put a bunch of symbols so we know exactly which one it is. Boom, doc format is TXT. <clears throat> doc format is MD. So we will slice, or excuse me, not slice, but split right at the period. And I think doc format, oh, okay, from format. And then we could say to format. So this goes to TXT to PDF. Um, Let's see what we got going on here. So this is plain text. This is, so if from format equals this, there's gotta be a smart way to do this. So we don't type it out eight different times because if we do that, the subtype, oh, dude, here we go. So doc format, here we go. Let me just make sure this works real quick. It does, wonderful. So if from format equals doc format txt, let's see. So we have, I think four of well, so I, I think I think the possibilities is four to the third. So four times four. No, it, yeah, it would just be sixteen possible things, right? So, but how can we do this smarter? Smarter. So if from format equals this, and then we can also do stuff like this and to format equals um, PDF. You know, give it some set of instructions, which would just be um, basically the content would then be assigned with PDF, and we could say plus content and ball. 
I think I think we could do that, right? And then basically it's turn content at the end. I think I think that's boom. Here we go. So expected. We did pass on that one. So we would have to do that for all of them, right? So if there's got to be a smarter way to cycle through the enum that so if doc format equals now what if we do PD at to TXT? So we got to do the inverse way, right? Or we could do all the TXT ones together real quick. So those will be the easiest for sure. So that'll work for that one. And then we got to do HTML one. So H1 and H2 guys. I think I'm going to cop out here in a sec, but this is roughly what it would do. I think for all of them. So let's find the HTML one. So expected. Oh, I see. I see. So expected doc format. Oh, we haven't done that one yet. So the, these are all of our TXTs. And then let's see. So these, these will all be the same. So the TXT is going to be done. Now we got to do PDF bunch of switch state. So it's a PDF, boom, boom, and boom. We could say content to TXT. I think that's all of them, right? So PDF to TXT. What we really need to do is say content equals content. And we're going to split basically at the PDF lines, right? We don't need those anymore. Print, come on, come on, keys, PDF object. And let's print out the content here to see if we get one of those. So that's pass. Let's see. I don't think we're going to get any of those in, in our, in our print statement here, but, but that's roughly what we want to do is that, right? Basically, we're going to do that like 10 times for all of them. Okay. So let's see, let's see though. Let's see what they've done. Oh, they just did a replace rather than just doing 40. That's a lot smarter. That's a lot smarter. Well, that's why this guy wrote this software and I'm the one learning from it. <laughs> but wonderful, 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 wonderful. Okay, guys, let's uh, let's submit and let's get to some Golang. I think that's the last of that series. I think I think that was the end of the, the course for, for that uh, chunk of Python. I believe such. And it was, and it was. So if we, if we pop over to the courses real quick, uh, let's see. Should should have that one completed now at this point. L scripts, I, I vaguely forget why why we did complete one. I must have missed one of the lessons or, or didn't fully submit it or something. They added a Git one, but I do have a Git thing in my deal. Python and algorithms and stuff and data structures. I'll, I'll definitely have a bit on, on recursion, stacks, queues, heaps, graphs, weighted graphs, acyclic graphs, all that fun stuff will be a good time. And learning it through Python will be wonderful. I've, I've got a ton of JavaScript tutorials, but I do want to learn JavaScript like from a after professional career standpoint, because I've, I've now gone through professional career and development through JavaScript. So I do think coming back to it's going to be really fun. And I'm going to pick up like really advanced concepts and stuff, just ironing out the board and just, you know what I mean? I've, I've developed a ridiculous amount of software last night. I built out this, this whole thing, which is, so what it does, it's, it's a, maybe I could, maybe I could show you guys real quick what it does. But I've, I've done an insurmountable amount of JavaScript and TypeScript at this point in my life, but Node obviously and backend development and all that fun stuff. Oh, okay. So this is some of what it is. Uh, just what I built last night, I had six hours to do it. So I'll run through all this stuff and uh, let me see. It's just, let's see, test, test, test. Oh, it's a heat up, boom, 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 test, 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 boom. Fires off to an API I built. That API is deployed on a PM2 cluster. That PM2 cluster is, I'm getting the payload here. I could download the PDF of all that information if I wanted. So here's that, boom, look at that. And I could, I'll just continue along, but here's the, the fun thing right here is this map component I had built where it shows the nearby properties, all that fun stuff, all that fun stuff. And then I was working on a, a graph element as well where you can see kind of certain trends. Oh, and then you can, you can search for the address as well. So, so a lot of, a lot of fun stuff there, but, but like I said, I've, I've done an insurmountable amount of JavaScript. There's a lot of JavaScript and TypeScript on this, um, channel already. So we will, we will come back and kind of iron out some of this, but the next chapters are just going to be us diving into Golang and, um, and, and developing APIs with Golang, because that's, that's actually what I'm learning right now. And it's it's, it's just timely, you know, it's just super important to learn, learn a statically typed language. I've, I've mucked around with Rust before and a few other languages, but, but really understanding Golang and, and a lot of companies are, are going to it for microservices because it's just, the, it's the go-to just super fast, super fast for, for comparatively the, the 
out of the complicated languages that you have to learn, where there's Rust, C++, uh, more more closer to the hardware type stuff, Golang is is almost there, and it's very performant. It's very, very, very performant. So it's it's better performance than the Pythons, the the TypeScripts, and JavaScripts. Um, I think I think Rust and C++ is still going to have it beat, but it is not a bad language. Golang performance is not a bad deal. So. So we're going to pop up to it. Let's see what these people say. They say yes and no. <coughs> it is mostly poor. Let's see, low-level control resources. You know, it's 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 not bad for, for let's see, what's his face? Who's, what's his name? What's his name? The Prime again. Prime again on Golang performance. He, he's got some performance tests of Golang, and, and he shows it off. It's Zig, a general perp. It's proper. It's proper. He does a bunch of performance tests and yeah, he just shows all the time and all this stuff. Here's Node. Here's a few others. Here's one with Python as well and a few of the other core core languages, but it's, yeah, it's it's not a bad language to learn. And, and there's a lot of companies that I've actually interviewed for previously who who specifically asked, hey, what's your experience with Golang? Because they, they were migrating their entire systems, their TypeScript databases or their TypeScript backends and Node.js backends to Golang. So in Python, you know, and all their Python Lambda functions to Golang. So, so I think, I think it's kind of picking up in a weird way, especially now that it's part of these, these kind of beginner backend courses and stuff. I, I think it would be very wise to focus some more time on that. So, but if you're not fully comfortable with JavaScript and servers and stuff, definitely sift through my channel. I will, I will definitely make a few videos on, on kind of like architecture of, of how kind of web dev works and kind of bird's eye view of, of these proxy servers and load balancers and how, how the server gets requested and how that goes to the database and how the database will deliver the data to the server and the server will deliver that data to the clients. Just kind of that basic client server database relationship. I, I, there's a lot of videos on my channel on that, but, but we definitely want to learn some, some deep, good writing API languages. And I think Golang is probably of the best Despite what that one Reddit post says, I think Golang is one of the best uh, we can get for for API languages. So and microservices. So I'm going to dive into that, guys. Thank you so much for for watching the Python. Uh, as we're we're going to circle back at some point. I hope. I hope. I hope. But certainly, we do need to dive into to Go, Docker, Kubernetes, all the fun stuff. So we're going to skip forward a smidge into Golang, and I will see you there. Cheers.